Hi everyone, welcome back to the 100 days of the 2023 National Electrical Code. My name is Ryan Jackson and I hope you're having a great day. We're just about done with Chapter 5. We're going to talk about Article 590 in this video, which covers temporary wiring. So just a small change here, in fact, a reduction of the requirements that we added in the 2020 code. So 590.8 was added in the 2020 NEC. And here for the 2023 code, the rules for current limiting overcurrent devices at the service was reduced. All right, so we're going to kind of go through this one slowly. Number one, service overcurrent devices. This only applies at the service. All right, so if you have a temporary wiring installation, remember temporary wiring can be as small as, you know, a little 50 amp outlet for building the house or what have you could be absolutely massive. I mean, I, I've seen temporary wiring that's thousands of amps, you know, for a big high-rise building or something. So here we're talking about the service overcurrent device. Nothing downstream of it, just the service. Overcurrent devices for solidly grounded three-phase Y-connected systems exceeding 150 volts to ground, not exceeding 1,000 volts line to line. All right, so let's just push pause there exceeding 150 volts to ground, not exceeding 1,000 volts line to line. Uh, here in America, the only voltage system that really fits into that is 277-480. Remember, this only applies to all Y-connected systems. It wouldn't apply to a 480-volt uh, corner-grounded system, so that would be 480 volts to ground, and that would exceed 150 volts to ground, but again, this is only for Y-connected systems. So here in the States, we're talking 277-480. If you're in Canada, or some areas very, very close to Canada, you might see a 347-600 volt three-phase four-wire Y. Either of those uh, would fall into the voltage parameters of this requirement. So if you have, again, for the States here, if you have 277-480 for your temporary service, then at the service disconnect, the overcurrent device must be a current limiting device, but now only if the available fault current exceeds 10,000 amps. All right, so the issue here is ground faults. Not necessarily short circuits, but ground faults. 277-480 is a particularly nasty voltage, and when I say that, I mean as it relates to ground faults. If you were to take a 120-volt circuit, black and white, and obviously don't do this at home, but if you were to take a black and white conductor, no fuses, no breakers, touch them together and try to pull them apart and see if you can pull an arc across them, the, the arc will self-extinguish. There's not enough power there to really sustain an arc. Now, if you were to try that with medium voltage, 7,200 volts or something, you'd blow your arms off, right? There's so much power, the, the arc would just blow apart. 277 is the perfect nasty voltage to where it is enough power to sustain the arc, but not so much power that it blows it apart. So what happens in a 277, 480 volt system is we'll start with an arcing fault, right? Neutral or a uh, line to ground arcing fault. And because of the arcing, it will ionize the air inside of the enclosure uh, because the, the arc kind of sustains and propagates. And what starts as a bad event cascades into a full-blown catastrophe going phase to ground to phase to phase to phase to line to neutral and we blow up the switch here. And that is actually why we have to have ground fault protection of equipment in section 230.95 if we have a 480 volt, 277 480 volt service exceeding a thousand amps or more. It, it's kind of the same issue here. We're talking about the 277 volt ground fault. Now this is for temporary wiring only at the service and quite frankly, I think this is kind of protecting ourselves from ourselves. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to temporary wiring, and, and those of you guys that have been in the field, you can certainly attest to this, um, a lot of times you have less than qualified persons thinking they're qualified. And you, you look outside and you, you see the tile guy out there, you know, wiring his saw right into the service or something stupid, you know, and it, it happens. Obviously, we don't want it to happen, but it does. So we want to make sure that if something goes wrong, it doesn't kill the person. So any overcurrent device on such a system has to be a current limiting device if the available fault current exceeds 10,000 amps. Now, what a current limiting device does is it opens extremely quickly. 
That can be a current limiting fuse or it can be a current limiting circuit breaker. There are both. So somebody's working in this equipment, energized, which they have no business doing, and we know they're not supposed to, but with temporary wiring, you see it all the time. So somebody's in there playing around with something that they're not qualified to play around with, no PPE or anything else, and they blow themselves up. How nasty is that fireball going to be? The nastiness of the fireball, what we call the incident energy in NFPA 70E, the incident energy is a function of the voltage and the available fault current and the clearing time of the overcurrent device. So if we have a current limiting fuse or breaker, the clearing time gets reduced drastically and the incident energy isn't nearly as large as it would be if a normal non-current limiting device were installed. So again, voltage, available fault current, and clearing time. Well, the clarification to this section in the 2023 says, listen, if the available fault current is low enough, then you're not going to get as bad of a fireball. That, that's the idea here. I'm, I'm not saying whether or not that's accurate or not, but that's the idea. So I can either limit the clearing time by putting in a current limiting device, or I can limit the available fault current, right? And maybe put these, uh, these service disconnects farther away from the transformer, get some more resistance to lower the available fault current, which might, might lower the incident energy. The biggest thing when it comes to incident energy though is the clearing time. So as you reduce the available fault current, that can sometimes increase the clearing time. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a tricky one. I understand why this change was made, but I don't necessarily agree with it. I would rather just see this thing be a current limiting device and then we know that the clearing time is going to be short and we know that safety can be assured. But there you go. There is Article 590 and that's it for Chapter 5. So hopefully we'll see you on the next video when we start getting into Chapter 6. We're going to start with Article 625, Electric Vehicle Power Transfer System. So I hope to see you there and I hope you have a great day.